chronic pancreatitis in children, genetic mutations in Germany. That is the title. I stopped to make, uh, I don't know why I'm invited here. I stopped to make research on pancreatitis because this organ is really boring. And uh, now I make uh, sugar transport in the intestine. And that's much more nice. And I decided to show some slide about sugar transport. But others said, no, that's a pancreas meeting. You cannot do it. So I have to talk about this boring disease. And um, in pancreatitis in children is quite different. And uh, in, uh, in uh, adults, it's very easy. It's alcohol and alcohol and alcohol, and uh, then some hereditary idiopathic uh, um, reasons. But this uh, does not uh, is affect in uh, children. And the main uh, um, cause of chronic and or acute recurrent pancreatitis, and for me, it's the same. It's uh, just the different ends of the same process, uh, process in most cases. It's idiopathic, and this means also genetic, because I think nearly all patients with idiopathic pancreatitis might genetic reasons or dispositions factors, at least a disposition if not causing, but I think that is a genetic disease as well as a so-called hereditary. And uh, then other reasons are quite rare, as uh, anatomic reasons, and that's uh, mainly colidocal cysts. It's, uh, I think, I have severe doubts that um, pancreas divisum is a real strong risk factor. Cystic fibrosis is very important. Uh, 10 to 15 percent of patients with cystic fibrosis who are pancreatic sufficient uh, show recurrent acute pancreatitis. Metabolic reasons, systemic uh, reasons, and this means IBD, and I think it's not a mucosal problem. You can see it also a high risk of pancreatitis for patients with ulcerative colitis, and this is not a local problem as in Crohn. So that's uh, autoimmune uh, reasons for um, acute recurrent pancreatitis as in lupus erythematosus or Schirken syndrome or other autoimmune diseases. And uh, sometimes uh, neoplastic, uh, this means uh, mostly lymphoma in the um, pancreas. <coughs> and what do we know? And we know um, since, uh, um, I think it was a, a man from city, no, it was from Pittsburgh. We know um, by the man from Pittsburgh, he is sitting here, I see, um, that trypsin is a very important uh, molecule in the um, Genesis, pathogenesis of chronic pancreatitis, and as by the odds ratios, it might be the most important uh, gene affecting the pancreas. And uh, it's thought that the increased activity of trypsin leading to an activation of the enzyme cascade and autodigestion, and the autodigestion might be the reason for the pancreatitis attack. And uh, the most frequent mutations worldwide observed in all populations are 122H. And R122H is located at the surface of the trypsin molecule. And there is a serine protease uh, um, cutting site, and uh, this is destroyed so that this molecule might be um, resistant to uh, degradation, might be, become more active. On the other way, these are data <coughs> from the um, uh, Turkish man with a Hungarian name, it's uh, Miklos Sajentot. Um, and according to this group in Baltimore, um, there is an increased uh, autoactivation of uh, this molecule, R, of this mutation R122H, uh, in addition to decreased degradation, and this is weaker in, uh, in, uh, in some other mutations. However, um, science has some progress, and if uh, you believe this data, and I think you might, uh, there are some reason to believe the data of this group, then is, uh, and you can see a very enhanced autoactivation in the presence of chymotrypsin C, so um, in compared to the wild type. So that uh, maybe the majority of uh, trypsin mutations, the pathogenic factor is not decreased degradation, it's enhanced autoactivation of the mutations. And besides trypsin and the increased trypsin activity, we have some other molecules uh, su such as SPINK1, SPINK1 also known as PSTI, pancreatic secretory trypsin inhibitor, or serine protease inhibitor cattle type 1. And in contrast to as a specific inhibitor of trypsin and decreased uh, activity of SPINK1 might also predispose to chronic pancreatitis in the same way as increased activity of trypsin due to gain of function mutations. And this is SPINK1, it's an inhibitory molecule. The inhibition is temporarily because SPINK1 acts itself as substrate for trypsin. And uh, if you look at the data, then you can find an 
increasement uh, of homozygous as well as heterozygous compared to controls and uh, in the European um, in the Western world, there is a frequency of approximately 2% heterozygous N34S Spink1 uh, carriers. N34S is the most common mutation. No homozygous, there was one homozygous individual described in an Indian controlled population uh, compared to 4% um, um, and 10 to 15% of homozygous or heterozygous in chronic pancreatitis groups. You see a marked difference in the frequency of the um, heterozygous and uh, how, uh, how many patients do you find who are, uh, have uh, problems. Uh, this uh, depends on the population background. And if you have a population with a low frequency of N34S, then many of your patients uh, will, uh, will be negative for this mutation. We have in Germany a general population frequency of 1.4%. And so we find frequently spink. In Italian, Italian studies, uh, there are only few cases of spink mutated pancreatitis patients of N34S. The reason is that the general population frequency is much, much lower. That is due to the fact that we have genetic gradients due to Neolithic colonization in Europe from northwest to southeast. Even here, in, in Hungary, oh no, that's not Hungary, it's Romania, or in uh, Turkey, um, there is a um, low frequency of Spink N34S in the general population. Um, <clears throat> so what is the meaning of N34S? And uh, I don't know, and nobody knows. What we know, and this is uh, data from the Japanese group, the same data are obtained by the um, Miklos Scientots group and by the French group, that there is no change of inhibitory activity of N34S compiled compared to the wild type. And what we know is that N34S is in strong linkage disequilibrium with four intronic variants. Unfortunately, also these variants does not, uh, do not seem to be the uh, bad boys, but we sequenced approximately 30 KB of this region, and there are more than 20 upstream and downstream variants in the SPINK1 region, totally or nearly totally linked to N34S. And uh, actually, we performed computer modeling by a new method published this year in Cell uh, to find the pathogenic variant and to make functional analysis. Um, Miklos said, uh, I should not do it, it's pain, um, but we use brain and to try to avoid the pain, Miklos. Okay, gain of function of trypsin, loss of function of SPINK1, then is uh, CFTR, and um, this science seems to be a very important molecule, and I think this would be the topic of your talk. Right after lunch. Okay, so I can skip CFTR. There's some linkage between CFTR and chronic pancreatitis, uh, but um, two-thirds of our patients do not have any mutations. And thus, uh, Mik uh, Miklos, uh, there's a question, is enzyme Y, that's an enigmatic uh, molecule with no substrate, no gene, is uh, also thought to be a trypsin inhibitor and activity, is this of importance? But nobody knows, uh, knew in the past what is enzyme Y. And again, a, a Hungarian guy and this Turkish guy, they found that chymotrypsin uh, C um, is, uh, identically, might be identically with uh, the so-called enzyme Y described by Heinrich Rinderknecht. And uh, this is a study published by Jonas Rosendahl, and that there was an association of uh, CTSC variants, 3% in patients with 07 in controls in idiopathic hereditary pancreatitis, also a strong association with tropical chronic pancreatitis, what is nothing else as idiopathic hereditary pancreatitis in the tropics, to my view, but also, interestingly, uh, association between alcoholic chronic pancreatitis and CTSC. Uh, this is nearly in the same extent. There are only two genes involved in alcoholic chronic pancreatitis who also in, are involved in idiopathic hereditary pancreatitis, this is CTSC and SPINK1. You will not find trypsin mutations, carboxypeptidase A1 or CL mutations in alcoholic pancreatitis, but here is an association. And if you see uh, the odds ratio, it's the odds ratio about 5.5, so it's a good risk factor. Uh, unfortunately, did you publish your CTSC data? Uh, it's in press. It's in press. It's, you, you did not find anything, unfortunately. Yes, we did. You find something? Yes. Oh, I'm happy now, okay. Oh, the, the, G, the G60G. 
Yeah, the G60 G60. Ah, that's published. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Yes. We, that's uh, also a variant with a lot of variants in the promoter uh, region, and uh, it might be influenced uh, in transcription levels. And it's actually associated with smoking rather than alcohol. The alcohol is positive because alcohol and smoking go together, but it's, it's uh, strongly linked with alcohol with an odds ratio above 8. In, in the CTSC? Yes. Oh, that's, that's interesting, but I think minor effect might be even stronger related, but this is a topic of Jonas, I, I feel. Um, um, but uh, smoking, yes, but are there any epidemiological data about passive smoking and the risk of pancreatitis? Uh, I don't know if that's published yet. Uh, okay, okay, so gain of function of trypsin, loss of function of SPINK1, CTSC, and maybe CFDR in some way is uh, associated to pancreatitis, but 60% of the patients do not have any mutations despite Sanger sequencing of all coding regions. And so we investigated the last years, and it needs uh, eight years, days A1, and it's activated by trypsin and chymotrypsin, and it's one of the most abundant pr uh, proteins synthesized in the exocrine pancreas. And these variants are strongly associated uh, with chronic pancreatitis. This is a terrible slide. If you are young people starting their career, never show such a slide, yes? That is, you cannot read it. Can you read the slide at the end of the, of the room? No, that's terrible, yes? <laughs> Professors do it, it's, 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 uh, no, it's terrible. But um, I, I want to zoom a little bit in to uh, even uh, that you can read it and maybe you might not read it, but, but you can see that there are some variations in bold. These are all Milsons, all Milsons variations in CPA1, but some are in bold. Why are some in bold? What we do, we made the mad men approach. We found 60 variants, and we found some variants in patients only, we found some variants in controls only, and we found some variants in patients and controls. What do, can you do? just lump all data and say, oh, we, every data we found, we, we count in the patient's group, every data we found in the control group, we will count, and then we will calculate. The problem is, if you found an innocent variant, this variant might be quite common. So 20% of the patients might have this variant and 20% of the controls. And if you have 5% other variants uh, not innocent, disease-causing, you find you will not see anything. So you have to have an approach, and um, the reviewer from the United States, as he submitted it in the, to Nature Genetics, said we should do an agnostic approach. Um, um, I think uh, Miklos is agnostic by the original term, but I, I don't like agnostic approach, and we made the Madman approach. The Madman approach is to take every variant we found, every missing variant we found, and to express this variant and to measure secretion and activity. And that was a hell of work, and unfortunately, there was some mistake in this uh, variant, and uh, then again, he, he did all this work in Baltimore. Um, so, uh, <laughs> 120 variants uh, at the end. And then we um, grouped the variants with a low activity, this means be le less than 20%, and say, okay, every variant, less, some, some variants you see are null variants with no activity, especially in this region, that's the, the, the start uh, of the end terminal, that's at the end of the protein, and some variants have the absolutely normal activity. And thus, we count just the variants with uh, apparent activity less than 20%, and we found an association, a uh, strong association with odds ratios uh, of uh, 25 and a very strong p-value we found in association, 3% in our patients compared to 0.1 in our controls. But um, this means only um, loss of activity, a strong loss of activity in controls. Some of these controls have a variant uh, very in the very at the beginning of the protein. And I think it's not only loss of function in CPA1, uh, which is the reason for pancreatitis. And what we look, we investigated um, the patients and uh, grouped it according to age. And uh, it's worse with um, nearly f more than 550 children, 586 uh, patients less than 20 years or 20 years uh, at study entry, not age of onset. And we found a strong association, especially in the very young 
age group. That means 10% of our German patients with chronic pancreatitis less than 20, 10 years or 10 years old showed the CBA1 variant compared to 0.1. That's a st very strong association. There was nearly no association. You see that's no significant p-value if you investigate patients older than 20 years. So this is an early onset uh, chronic pancreatitis gene. This is an infant pancreatitis uh, gene, and it's not a general a chronic pancreatitis gene. It's a very, very young age of onset. And if you compare it in German children, that's our um, compiled from the Nature Genetics paper, but not all patients, just the patients collected in the Munich Center, but this is a multi-center study from the GPGE. So every center in Germany is sending us uh, patients, uh, um, so it's uh, uh, all parts of Germany. So, um, so you can find in 20 patients, in 11%, uh, less than 10 years, uh, CPA1 mutation, compared in trips for, to trypsin in 8%, SPINK1 13%, and CTLC 5%. Only one patient was heterozygous, transheterozygous for SPINK1, and three patients were transheterozygous for CFDR, but in these two cases is the question, is it an innocent variant or is it a harmful variant? We does not know. R122H is associated to pancreatitis. So in the very young patients group, CPA1 is more common than trypsin mutations. But if you look to the odds ratio, you will see the strongest odds ratio is uh, for trypsin compared to, to CPA1, uh, as even also in the, in the very young uh, patients group. It's the same odds ratio in SPINK1 and CTSC, both genes you can find in pediatric pancreatitis and in adult pancreatitis. Um, SPINK1, uh, uh, trypsin also, but especially trypsin and CPA1 are pediatric genes. <coughs> and um, the strong odds ratio is that you never, nearly never find any heterozygous trypsin patient in the general population, and we have some heterozygous variants here in CPA1. Maybe these variants are not harmful, and so the, maybe the odds ratio is around 100 and not uh, 38 for CPA1. And every study needs a replication group, and we replicated it uh, in the European control in patients from India and in Japanese, and uh, also in all these uh, replication controls, um, the, um, uh, the results were, insig were significant. Uh, it's worth of note uh, that in all these three cohorts, uh, patients were 20 years of age or less. So this is a pediatric study, yes? These are only this data, we, we investigated also some older patients in Germany, but the Czech patients, the Polish patients from Gregor, uh, the French patients, the Japanese and Indian patients are all pediatric patients, yes? So we have data about genetics uh, in uh, pancreatitis. So, but we did not say it's a pediatric study, but it's a pediatric study, yes? Um, why is uh, carboxypeptidase A1 harmful? What is the petal mechanism? Normally, we are, uh, normally, we think there's an equilibrium of inhibitors and proteases within the pancreatic parenchyma, and there might be a disbalance mm -hmm. that the gain of proteases or a loss of inhibitors predispose to acute recurrent or chronic pancreatitis. And the question is, is that when, if a gain of function in trypsin or loss of function of trypsin inhibitors or trypsin-degrading enzymes such as CTSC or SPINK1, uh, cause pancreatitis. How can a loss of function of a protease such as CPA1 cause chronic pancreatitis? And this was, uh, this was really said. And Miklos said, uh, Miklos is uh, here, I think you have also a talk, secretion defect is a common loss of function phenotype, I learned it from him, and CPA1 is one of the most abundant proteins in pancreatic secretions. So uh, we uh, formulate the theory that there is a secretion uh, defect, that's a nice slide. Uh, I hope the data are correct. I have stolen it. He visited my lab and had a talk. I just draw his talk on my PC. Yes, I do it always. If you come to a talk, all your slides are on my PC for years, yes? So, um, so that is a strong uh, um, defect of, uh, of uh, secretion. And uh, if there is a defect of secretion, there may be an accumulation induction of ER stress. And we performed, or Miklos performed, um, some experiments that there was a hint that uh, ER stress induction might be the pathogenic um, mechanism, at least for this variant. 
How, however, um, the world is more complex than we want that the world is complex. And uh, so some CPA1 variants analyzed by Niklos, Miklos now do not show really ER stress and other harmless uh, variants show also something like this. Is this correct? You will bring it in your talk. Uh, I'm not going to talk about CPA1. Oh, yes, CPA1 it's is boring. The, some, of, some of the variations show ER stress. They shouldn't. Yes, uh, so, so shit happens, uh, um, uh, but fortunately this is uh, still published, so it doesn't matter. But I think ER stress might be one of the mechanisms. Uh, maybe also in some CTSC variants, maybe there are uh, some hints that ER stress might be one of the uh, mechanisms. Um, what we did uh, in collaboration with Hannah Algel from uh, Munich, we performed a, an end 256K, that's the most common variant found six in six independent families knock in and a pancreas specific CPA1 knockout mouse. Unfortunately, the strategy was not the best, but now we have uh, at least heterozygous mice and what we see is a ballooning of the endoplasmic reticulum in this mice and this might be a hint for ER stress in this mice, but I think we, don't, we need uh, one year more or two to uh, publish the data, but uh, the data are on the, the mice data are very promising. This is the human gene. Hmm? Knocking of the human gene or knocking into the mouse gene? We, 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 we no, no, that, that's, uh, as, as you see, it's a knockout of the mouse gene and it's a knock in of, of this mutation in the mouse gene. The, mut the mutation is highly uh, conserved, the, 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 the amino acids, yes? So, um, and uh, the knockout do not show anything, <laughs> and the knock-in, this is the, the knock-in, yes? The knock-in is, uh, is a problem, indicating that not the loss of function of CPA1, so a misfolded CPA1 and induction of some cellular responses might be important. So, if you have the phenotype, why do you need two more years? Hmm? No, 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 not the, the phenotype is not completely. So uh, we talked yesterday about the wine. Yes, and the wine was nine years old, and the wine was very good. Imagine if the wine would be two years old. It is the same quality, no? And you know, I always need ages to publish something. Uh, yes, um, uh, never collaborate with me, or uh, especially if you are older than 60, so you will never see have the paper with me. If you are 30 or 40, you can dare it. Yes. Um, uh, yes, sorry. Um, so CPA1 is strongly associated to chronic pancreatitis. It's a large, uh, a lot of private mutations, not a common variant, and it might be a new pathomechanism induction of ER stress. It's difficult to have a um, final answer, and it's a strong risk factor comparable to PSS1 variant. And the most important thing is if we talk about genetic variants, then you see this. CPA1, 3%, SWINC1, 20%, CFDR, 11%. Oh, important risk factor, 11%. More important than CTSC. CEL, that's a new gene. Jonas will talk about it. So C CFDR is more important than CTSC, CPA1. But that's not the, all, the complete story. If you make a genetic association study, you test for association. And that means you need controls. And you mean, that means you need ethnically matched controls, yeah? If you perform, uh, uh, um, if you perform uh, genetic studies in, uh, in uh, African French, yes, and you take uh, French controls from the Bretagne, then you will find big differences, but this is not due to, to, to pancreatitis, it's just the case that Africans look a little bit um, uh, another way, uh, at least as a skin uh, uh, color, as we, and that's uh, genetically. So uh, you need ethnically matched controls. And if you do so, you will see there is nearly, there's no, no, nearly no control positive for PSS1 and also nearly no positive for CBA1, giving very strong odds ratios of 1,170 in idiopathic pancreatitis if this variant or 25 for CBA1. There are 1.5% uh, in the head, uh, general population of SPINC1, making an odds ratio of 15, or if you have homozygous N34S, uh, about 100, uh, more than 100. But if you compare this CTSC and CEL, it's a 1% in the general population, making an odds ratio of 5. CFDR is very common, 
but CFDR is the weakest risk factor because the variance we count in the general population is 4%, making an odds ratio of 3.5 or of compound heterozygous of uh, 16. So it's not only important the frequency of genetic defects you uh, found in your patient sample, it's a question what is the frequency in the general population. And some defects, as these defects are 122H or some carboxypeptidase variants, or even homozygous SPINK1 explain a lot. But if you have a heterozygous SPINK1 and 34S, a heterozygous CFDR, a heterozygous CTSC, it explains nearly nothing, only a little, little part of the pathogenesis. So, and most important, most patients have mutations in several genes. So these are two three patients, homozygous for N34S or compound heterozygous for CTSC, who have a mutation in SPINK1 or CFDR, and there are also patients in our group who have mutations in three different genes. So um, this is a very complex genes, and if we count all these uh, variants, then we can see that we have a strong enrichment of homozygous patients, especially SPINK1, of compound heterozygous, and more important, there's a very strong enrichment of transheterozygous. That means patients who have a SPINK1 mutation and CTSC mutations, or CTSC and uh, um, CEL uh, or um, trypsin mutation. And uh, in total, if we count homozygous, compound heterozygous, transheterozygous, that means at least two genetic defects in one or two genes, then we have a frequency of 12%, and uh, in the controls, 0.2%. And uh, that means a very, very strong uh, risk factor. And if you know more genes, CAL is coming, and some other genes, new genes, then we will find um, may maybe even stronger risk factors for multiple transheterozygous patients. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>